Well, we're wrapping up 1 Timothy. It feels like we've been in here a while because we have been in this book a while. Uh, Just to give you a heads up, the next several weeks uh, we're going to be kind of hopping around, standalone messages. Uh, We'll be hearing back uh, starting next Sunday. We'll be hearing a little bit from our Philadelphia team and beginning to hear some mission reports of trips that have gone on the last several months. And so that'll be next Sunday uh, just for a little while, and then an entire Sunday I uh, dedicated that on the 30th. And so uh, that's what you have to look forward to in the month of August. Uh, we'll be in uh, just, again, standalone messages. And so uh, there's been just a, some great stuff uh, I felt like that we've been in uh, learning in the book of Timothy. We have to remember that a specific uh, man, Paul, wrote to a specific another man, Timothy, uh, his son in the faith, a leader, uh, an overseer, an elder uh, pastor in the church in Ephesus. And uh, if anything, First Timothy reminds us and encourages us that we are to continue doing what God has called us to do until it is no longer our job to do that and to hand that off to the next generation of those that will continue to do that until it's their, no longer their job and they'll hand it off to those who are continuing to do that all until a major theme that comes to a head this week that we see in Paul's writings and that is the return of Jesus Christ. That weighs heavily in the both Old Testament and the New Testament, specifically in the writings to the churches, is this constant reminder that Jesus Christ is returning. I think the longer we get from his ascension, from him going to be back with the Father, we begin maybe to doubt if he is going to return. Maybe we may feel like he has just abandoned us, that the world is too crazy for him to come back to it. Uh, But we have to continue in our faith that one day he will return. And as Intriguing as it might be to try to figure out whether we are close to that now or not, if what we are seeing unfold in the world is that time or not, we have to remember that one day Jesus Christ is going to return. And along with that, we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to give an account of what we have done in our lifetime. All of us will give an account before the Lord, but specifically us, if you can imagine what it'll be like when, if we were around when he comes back, what that will be like. And so as we wrap up this book in 1 Timothy and we see some some important instructions that Paul is giving Timothy at the end of his letter, we have to remember that all of these things are within the understanding that one day Jesus Christ is going to come back. And so because that is true, we should continue in doing what he's called us to do. And the melodic line, this main idea this morning that I want you to think about and focus on is a little different than we normally do, but it's just simply a question. Will you be found faithful when Jesus appears? Will you be found faithful when Jesus appears? These last few verses of the book of 1 Timothy wrap up with giving us five final instructions. And so Paul wanted Timothy to really focus almost like a grand finale of fireworks. Does Paul come with these instructions after instructions? And so it may seem like a lot and it all works together though to make what has been true across the whole entire book. We will see that the book began and it ends in the same manner. But the first instruction that we see Paul giving Timothy and by extension us here this morning is that we should flee evil and pursue Jesus. Look what verse 11 says. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and steadfastness, and gentleness. And so we get this, what is common in Paul's teachings, this idea of fleeing something, which means to get out quickly. It means a a constant state of evasive action. It certainly is the opposite of lingering. So Paul tells Timothy that he ought to flee these things. And so what are these things that he refers to? And so specifically within our book, it refers back to what Michael did such a great job with last week when he talked about these different doctrines that exist. Now remind you, let me, let me pause there for a second. Paul is not critiquing in most of his letters the world. He is warning and critiquing the church. And so those different doctrines that Timothy was to be on guard against were not things that were out there that the world was saying. It was those doctrines that make their way into churches. And so Timothy has to pay careful attention and by extension the church there in Ephesus and you and I have to pay close attention to these things that that we ought to flee those. And those are the different doctrines that set themselves up against the sound 
words of Jesus Christ. Namely, like we saw last week, godliness as a means of gain. And so these are the people who teach godliness as a means of gains. If you haven't seen the documentary uh, Secrets of Hillsong, looking at the church there in Australia that has some campuses here, that's a great explanation of what it looks like when a church tries to leverage the gospel for personal gain. And so it's not something that just the church in Ephesus struggles with. It's the church contemporarily struggles with all the time, leveraging the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that they have personal gain from. Instead of being content, they have a desire to be rich, which comes from a love of money. And so one of the things the early church struggled with and the church today is a a deep love for money. That's one of these things that Paul tells Timothy to flee from. But I'll just remind you that you don't just make this about money. Paul also says that to, to other people or other churches, he uses the same language of fleeing. And when he does, he talks about fleeing things like sexual temptation. He talks about fleeing idolatry. He tells Titus to flee those who have a quarreling spirit. And so a Christian should never tolerate or loiter around sinfulness that comes from false teaching. We should always be ones that are running away from that, fleeing it in whatever form it presents itself. But notice that it's not just simply about fleeing as if Christians are just constantly running away from everything. No, the doctrine that the faith of Christianity teaches is not just fleeing, but fleeing from something, but pursuing into something. It's fleeing evil and supplementing that with pursuing Jesus. Notice it says for us to pursue. And like I said, there's always a negative. If there's a negative in Christianity to go away from, there's always a positive to go into something, towards something, to take hold of something. It's never just running away from something. We see this in other language that Paul says and other writers in the Bible when it says that we are to put off certain things. And then it says for us to put on other things. And Jesus talked about denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him. So it's not just the negative there, it's also a positive. When you pursue something, you collect it. You you train in it. You develop it. If you're pursuing good health, or you're pursuing a stable income, or you're pursuing uh, uh, you know, a future wife or a future husband, you, you begin to look at those things differently and, and to try to be in those places where those things are. The same is true in a spiritual sense. You're fleeing from those things that are negative and, and dangerous and deadly, but you're also walking towards pursuing something that is positive. And notice the words that Paul uses. He says for us to pursue righteousness, which is simply a right living or right attitude towards God and towards man. So we should be living in a relationship that is right between us and God. And we also should be living in a relationship that is right between us and each other. It talks us about pursuing godliness, which is simply being devout to God. If we keep it within the context of this chapter we're in, then we are devout towards God. We're not devout towards money. We're not letting money rule our hearts. We're not letting money drive our agendas. We're letting God do that. If he decides to bless, praise the Lord. If he decides to bless us with poverty, praise him too. All right, whatever it is, (coughs) we are devout (coughs) towards God. Man, I need another Lord's Supper. Uh, (coughs) We are pursuing faith. This is not necessarily our understanding of who God is uh, and our belief in the truth of the God is, it's having integrity. It's having, can, where's Travis? All right, somebody get me water before I start sounding like, there you go, Michaela for the win. Come on up here, you're on video now. Thank you. I just, I just had a fear that my voice was going to crack and go high. And then Corey was going to take the video, and I would never live that down. Here we go. So, we are to pursue love. 
This is the type of sacrifice and service that we have towards others, which when we compare it to money, is the opposite of greed. Greed is like, give me more, more, more for me. Love is sacrificing for others. And then it says steadfastness, which simply means the patience that we have in difficult circumstances. And I want to connect that to the next word, which is gentleness, and that is patience with difficult people. I've got it, buddy. Thank you. Lex, you're doing great. Keep that up, buddy. Steadfastness and gentleness. So patience in difficult circumstances and patience with difficult people. In some leadership books, we talk about this as failure of nerve or failure of heart. When we're not steadfast, we have a failure of nerve. Whatever the situation is, is difficult, and it causes us to be cowardice, to shrink back, to be quiet. But when the situation is difficult, sometimes it also causes us to shrink back from being gentle towards people. And so if we're called to pursue those things, it calls us to be strong in the situation, to be steadfast, but it also calls us to be gentle with those around us. In pastoral life, you struggle with one of these, one of, one of these two things mainly. I don't struggle normally with a failure of nerve. I struggle with a failure of heart. I forget that the people that I'm leading I'm to constantly be loving and gentle towards them, even in the midst of a difficult situation. So you're wired one way or the other. Maybe you're one of the unfortunate people that uh, you, you will uh, jump ship and not like anybody, but normally you one, one or the other, you struggle with that. And notice that we're to flee the doctrine that would lead us to evil and pursue these things. Next, he moves on to... Verse 12, it says, fight the good fight of faith. And so if we're to flee evil and pursue Jesus, we're also to fight the good fight of faith. And the language here in the Greek really opens itself up to be a fight or a competition. So we could be leaning on a military language or we could be simply leaning on the athletic language that Paul uses from time to time. But notice, I need to say this in our contemporary American church culture. Fighting in a Christian sense, in a biblical sense, has never been about toppling governments and it's never been about destroying one's enemies. Now the government, as God's ordained order, can be about those things. But the people of God can never be about fighting to overthrow the government that we live in or fighting to own one of our enemies. That's the opposite of what Jesus would tell us to do. And so when you think about this, we think about what sort of moves in our fight might be allowed. There's a prevailing wisdom in churches sometimes that actually is not wise at all, that the means, the means that you and I use to fight, depending on the fight, are justified by the end. So for fighting the good fight of the faith, no holds are barred because at the end of the day, we'll have our faith. But that's, that's not what's true, because notice that it says, fight the good fight of the faith. So what's the context here is that it's the fight associated with holding on to the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Not just the knowledge of the faith, but the experience of that faith, how that faith is lived out. And so we're not to be people or warring like the world wars. We are to be warring like Jesus told us to war. We are not fighting for things that are temporary. We were fighting for things that are eternal. We're fighting by turning our other cheek. We're fighting by going the extra mile. We're fighting by suffering well. We're fighting by not slandering our enemies, by not hating our enemies, but by loving them and serving them. We're fighting in the ways that Jesus fought. His fight. Never do you see Jesus engage the world in a fighting manner. You always see Jesus fighting to maintain his faith, to maintain his image, to maintain the thing that that God had sent him to do, to maintain his trust in others, to maintain in trust in God and his love for other people. Those are the type of things we see Jesus doing. And I wonder, particularly men, why the men is so underrepresented in the church that they see following Jesus as weak or boring because they don't see the fight that really exists. Following the Lord and continuing to follow the Lord has been the greatest fight of my life. 
and will continue to be the greatest fight of our life. No matter what type of enemy you've ever been put up against, nothing matches your sinful flesh and this world and Satan. And we're called to fight that fight of faith. It is the greatest fight that we could fight. And it's more important than any other faith or any other fight you would find yourselves. So we're to fight the good fight of faith. But next he says to also take hold of eternal life. Look what it says in the scriptures. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called. And about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So just like a fight is a struggle and you have to continue in it so that you win. We are commanded to take hold of eternal life. Notice that this is the confession that Timothy made. At some point early in Timothy's life, he made a confession of faith in Jesus Christ, not by himself, but he made it in the presence of other people. And so Paul's reminding him as he looks forward to these type of battles he's going to face for him to take hold of that eternal life, which is the confession that he made early in his life. And we do this all the time. We are always faced with various choices. If we're going to choose that which is important to us, Or we're going to choose a lesser version of it. Will we choose the best thing or will we settle for better or good? Or even sometimes bad. I think about this as I try to maintain my weight right now. I I struggle with my weight. It fluctuates. And so I'm trying to to, to uh, be healthier. And so when I'm presented throughout the day of what I will eat and how I will do that, I'm, I'm choosing... I'm trying to choose to take hold of a healthier lifestyle. When I take hold of that lifestyle, it means I'm not taking hold of various activity levels uh, or various foods and those sorts of things. And so as you can see here, Paul is encouraging Timothy to stretch forward and grab a hold of the most important thing, which is life. Jesus came so that we may have life and have it abundantly. And you and I, it just doesn't happen passively. We have to take hold of it. We have to stretch out to it. We have to choose what is best. And if Jesus is Lord and we proclaim that He is, this is not some easy decision. We we choose a life that will most likely be filled with trials and tribulations. We choose a life that will include probably more of suffering and shame. We choose a life that may end in our own death for faith in Jesus Christ. None of those things, when compared to the life that we have, can even compare. So if those things can't compare to God, then certainly simpler things like money and comfort and ease and acceptability and having more friends or popularity, none of those things can compare. If life is, more, is greater than any of the worst things that can happen to us, then life still has to be greater than any of the good things that can happen to us. And we are to reach forward and take hold of eternal life. We're also to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach, reproach until Jesus appears. Verses 13 through 16 almost feel like in this text that we've paused at the top of a roller coaster and now Paul is going to send us rushing down into this concept. Listen to what these scriptures say. And so he's been, he's been encouraging him and commanding him to do certain things, but now it feels like it builds to a crescendo where it says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who, is in, the, who, is, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which He will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And so it's a charge here, which seems stronger than what we've been reading, but it's a charge to first and only keep the commandment. What does it mean by keep the commandment? So because he says the commandment, and because this teaching, this letter has a lot of instructions in it, and it's been talking about faith as once and for all handed down from, uh, to the saints, and it talks about comparing the faith from false teaching, we, we can be confident that the commandment 
is all of the things that Paul has been teaching and encouraging Timothy to follow. It, it, it's a summary statement that includes everything above. He says to keep the commandment spotless and blameless, which means that it's not been, it's not been mixed with any other sort of thing. And it's not been exhibited in a way that causes reproach. Interestingly, the same language is used when it talks about leadership in the church, that it is leaders are to be above reproach, which means they don't live their lives in a way that people can call into question their lifestyle or the doctrine that they're teaching. The same thing is true of holding this faith. So if I'm to keep the commandment spotless and above reproach, how in the world do I do this? Like, do we... Do we keep it secret and keep it safe? Like we never share our faith with anyone. We never demonstrate or say that we're publicly a Christian. I kind of think that we do this sometimes in our cars. We don't put crosses on our cars because some of us drive like pagans. um, And we don't want to bring the name of Jesus into disrepair. That's why I don't put stuff on my car. Uh, That's actually why we don't have a a sticker to put on our cars, Brookwood members. Um, But... At the, at the end of the day, what does it mean to, to keep this spotless and blameless? Do we shrink back from the world and avoid any kind of contact? Which will really be what I talk about next week and how we live and raise our families and exist in a world that seems hostile to the gospel. Certainly it's not. But before we answer how we do this, notice that Paul uses two things to motivate him. First, is the presence of God, who is the giver of life, and also of Christ, who made the good confession. What what confession did Jesus make? He said a lot of important things. But particularly in John, when John records Jesus before Pontius Pilate, and he says, they say, Pontius says, they say you're king of the Jews. Is that true? And so Jesus and Pontius have this kind of dialogue that ultimately Jesus says is true. I am the king of the Jews. And so Pontius takes Jesus back to the Jews and he said, what does he say? I I have not found anything wrong with him. Jesus went to the cross because he confessed that he was the king of the Jews. And so if Jesus did that, then he should serve as an example for us to follow And it also should be motivating that He is in our presence right now. And so when you and and I are called to hold that confession before everyone else, realize that we are not doing anything that Jesus has not already done and has given us the Spirit that we might already be able to do this thing. So He's saying, hey, I charge you in the presence of God who gives us all things, specifically life, and I charge you before Jesus who has already made this confession To hold these things pure. Don't corrupt them with what you're doing. The second thing he says is that Jesus who made the confession is also the one who will appear. And it should be motivating to us, not in fear, but in awe, that one day Jesus Christ will return. He will come in His proper time, The writers of the New Testament were not sure when that would be, but they were all 100% confident that it would happen. And we live 2,000 years later knowing that He will return at any moment. And that should motivate us. That should encourage us to hold these things true. And what is common in Paul's writings is when he begins to talk about God and Christ and all that they have done, his writing begins to spin up almost, almost in a distracted way of his worship of God. Listen to what he says. It is God alone who is sovereign. It is God who is King of kings and Lord of lords. It is only God who lives forever. It is only God who dwells in unapproachable light, which simply means that there is not a smidge of darkness and there is no chance of it ever to be overrun by darkness. That he is is light And it is only God who remains unseen. To Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So in order for you and I to keep this 
commandment, spotless and blameless. We have to jettison any idea that you or I are going to do this by our own wisdom or power. This is nothing that you can do. You don't have enough money or strength or networking or power or toughness to keep this the way that it is. It's only something that you and I can remain can do by remaining in relationship with God himself. Instead, it requires us to do that which the faith has taught us. And I'm backing out right now from 1 Timothy, just talking about it in plain language. What is the faith all about? To be in constant communion with God. To be in regular confession and repentance of sin. To learn to obey the Holy Spirit in the pursuit of godliness and to rinse and repeat every day until He returns. That is what the faith has taught us and that is how we keep the faith pure and blameless. Our time in this book draws to a close with a last instruction to simply guard the deposit which is really what we've probably used the most in this sermon series, to guard the deposit. This letter ends exactly how it began. Listen to what verse 20 and 21 say. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. We guard the gospel Again, not because the gospel is weak, but because it is that which we are saved by. So we guard it because of its importance, not because of its weakness. We guard both the content of the gospel. There is no other way that man can be saved. No other way, no matter how nice it's presented or how sweet it's spoken of. There is no other way except through faith in Jesus Christ can a man or woman be saved in this world. And those who call on the name of the Lord will begin immediately by the power of the Holy Spirit to conform their lifestyle with His. There is no group in this world that is being shortchanged and asked to give up anything that everyone has been asked to give up. We are all called to deny ourselves, to take up a cross, and to follow Jesus. That is the faith. That is what you and I are to guard. And the way that we can tell that there is a counterfeit is not by studying the counterfeits. It's by studying the real thing. And Paul encourages Timothy to do this. And in our world, there is some obvious distinctions between false doctrines and the truth of the gospel. But you know what? In watching that Secrets of Hillsong and some other documentaries out there, there's some subtle distinctions that a lot of good meaning, or at least they sound good meaning Christians, bought hook, line, and sinker. And so I would encourage all of us to focus regularly on what the good news says and what the good news calls us towards so that we might hold fast to it and resist the false teachings that make their way in to our lives and into our churches. This is what we're called to do. I read a, in closing, I read a funny story this morning about a husband and a wife. They were on a boat had a cage all over it and they were in the middle of an alligator farm and the guy who was driving the boat told him and said listen here's the deal you anybody jumps out of this boat and swims to that bank and makes it they get a million dollars a little bit of time went by and he heard a splash and this man was swimming as hard as he could to that bank and he made it and so the guy went and visited the couple in, his ho- in their hotel room to give him the check. And he said, man, I tell you what, no one's ever took me up on that. And it's amazing that you made it, that you jumped out of the boat. He said, man, I didn't jump out of that boat. Somebody pushed me. <laughs> and his wife had a big old smile on her face. All of these things that we've been commanded to do, we may think that it was a conversation between Paul and Timothy. And it was. But it was between Paul and Timothy and the church in Ephesus. And just like we all need someone to push us every now and again, we need each other to push us every now and again. 
to have a church body that encourages these things. There's no way you can do this alone. You do this through the power of God and you do this by each other. We, us, flee evil and pursue Jesus together. We fight the good fight of faith. We take hold of eternal life. We keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until Jesus appears. And we guard the deposit. It's not just you. And if your life right now, it's just you, I would encourage you to think long and hard about the grace that Paul references as he closes the letter. That grace comes to us in many different shapes and sizes, but I don't think that grace comes to us quite as clear as it comes to us when he gives us a church family. And we need that. And so I ask you, will you be found faithful when Jesus appears? Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you for this, this book and this word this morning, God, that, that is such a challenging ending to a book. All these things we're commanded to do. All these things we're called to do. And every one of them is difficult and filled with danger and suffering. It's hard. It is the opposite of what the world promises us. It's opposite of what other false teaching promises us. That, that we take hold of Jesus so that we can have more money and better health and more friends. But Lord, all of that's a lie. We take hold of the suffering of Jesus Christ in His way so that we might have life. And I pray, Lord, that You would help us help us to lean into these things that You've called us to, not by our own power, but by Yours. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to realize that it is in us, that I'm not talking to individuals this morning only, I'm talking to a group. And if there's anyone in this congregation, in this sanctuary that doesn't have a church family, that you would encourage them to do so. And if there's anyone in this worship service now that doesn't know you, that they can't begin to do the things you've called them to do because they are still stuck at go, that they may see the beauty of the good news of Jesus Christ, that He came and died in their place so that they may have life. And they take hold of it, not by their own merit, not by their own money, but by their own faith, which is a gift from you. That that would be the starting point for some of us in this place to publicly profess that we, in fact, do believe in Jesus Christ and receive his salvation. Whatever it is, God, that you're calling us to do, I pray, Lord, that we would take that opportunity right now. We pray this in Jesus Christ. Amen.